Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into today's episode. When it comes to Bitcoin, self-custody is of course the name of the game. If you leave it on an exchange or you hold it via an ETF, it's good that you've got exposure, but in reality, it is just an IOU. And when it comes to self-custody, there are so many options available. My personal favorite is Collaborative Custody Multisig. So this is an episode all about that. Today's guest is Phil Geiger. He's the VP of Product Marketing at Unchained Capital, a financial services company that offers collaborative custody, Bitcoin back loans, and several other related services. I wanted to get Phil on the show to really dig deep into their collaborative custody model and understand how it all works and fits together. Whether you've already got a solid understanding of the model or you're just beginning, there's something in this discussion for everyone, and I think you'll find it most valuable. As always, would love your feedback. That's enough from me. Over to the show. Cheers. Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There is no second best crypto asset. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Why Bitcoin Show. I'm your host, Dale Warburton. It's a weekly podcast on why Bitcoin matters and what makes it completely different to all other cryptocurrencies. If you're interested in Bitcoin and you'd like to distill crypto fact from fiction, you've come to the right place. Firstly, tell me this, Phil. Did you manage to catch the um, eclipse? Because you're in Texas, aren't you? I did, yeah. I saw it yesterday. Brilliant. And um, was it as good as the videos I saw online? Like some people some people cried. I mean, I don't know if I would necessarily cry, but it did look quite kind of special. Yeah, I didn't get uh, emotional in that way, but it did feel... There was almost like a fight or flight response that kind of kicked in for me. Like I was getting a little bit, uh, I don't know, just a little bit feeling weird before it. And then during it, it was very eerie. So it was very, very dark out for two minutes, like pitch, like middle of the night, but even different than like middle of the night because, uh, yeah, when it's nighttime, like the moon is still providing a lot of light. And this was just like dark and it was kind of quiet for about two minutes. And then it was amazing how quickly it, uh, got light again. It wow. Got light in, in less than a minute, I would say from, or maybe like another two minutes, it was almost bright again. Wow. And what time was that on your end? Uh, yeah. So it was, uh, the to- totality was at one thirty PM central time here in Texas. So I'm in Austin okay. and it was slowly getting dark, you know, for about an hour, 45 minutes before that. And then, yeah, I got light again within five to 10 minutes. So very wow. quickly lit back up. That was almost as surprising as it being dark. Wow. What a wild phenomenon. And I've never, I've never experienced anything quite like that, but it must be absolutely wild to see, you know, pitch black at sort of one thirty. Um, yeah. Yeah. And- there were a lot of, a lot of comments out there about people like, you know, thousands of years ago, this must have just been absolutely chaotic for humans who didn't know what was going on or what was happening. Yeah. Um, and even knowing, like I said, even knowing that it was all going to be okay and, you know, it's just getting darker. It was just, there's something about it that was just un, almost unnatural feeling. Was totally, really cool. totally. And there's almost this feeling of like, um, kind of when I tend to feel this when I head into the bush and I go and talk about the African bush and, look up at the stars and you can just see the Milky Way and it's just thousands, thousands of stars and you kind of just feel really insignificant. And then you have something like that happen. Um, you know, there's something, you know, I'm not going to say there's something necessarily bigger. I know, uh, you know, that's a whole other can of worms, but I'm just thinking to myself, like, it's phenomenal, these these types of experiences with the natural world. And I find it really humbling to be, any, to, you know, to be honest, like, uh, and I would love to have seen it. I don't know when we're going to experience anything like that in the Southern Hemisphere, but it's it's quite amazing it went through texas too i just saw the arc of it and um you know uh i suppose um that brings us to today's conversation therefore sorry i thought i wanted to touch on that because that was that just happened um firstly, well, it makes sense to touch on that you know the moon uh eclipsed the sun as bitcoin is about to eclipse the dollar and all other fiat currencies well there we go there we go that's the great segue that i was needing and um well, firstly, welcome to the show. Um, really great to have you, Phil. Um, perhaps as a little sort of primer for the guests, won't you, or for the uh, listeners rather, won't you please just share a little bit about your background and how you got into Bitcoin, and then we can chat a little bit more about kind of all things Bitcoin. Thanks for having me, Dale. And yeah, for your 
uh, listeners or watchers. I'm Phil Geiger. I'm the VP of product marketing at Unchained. I've been a Bitcoiner now for, this is actually my 10th year in Bitcoin. So I was lucky. I learned about it kind of the end of 2014. And I was really just in the right place at the right time. I'd had a little bit of priming in that I studied economics in undergrad and was working in uh, healthcare tech at the time. So I had a little bit of the economics, a little bit of the tech, and just learned enough of the puzzle pieces uh, at the end of 2014, where Bitcoin piqued my curiosity. And very soon after that, purchased my first Bitcoin, started getting into it and fell deep down the rabbit hole. I didn't start working professionally in Bitcoin until about 2017, where I left my fiat career behind and started doing some you know, personal writings and some consulting with a few different startups, and then joined Unchained in 2019, where I helped to really accelerate and grow the Vault product to start. Uh, then I you know, formed the concierge onboarding team, which helps to teach people how to use hardware wallets, ship them right to your door, gets them all set up, and then gets your Bitcoin secured in a multi-sig vault. And uh, have recently transitioned off of that team and and more lead our general product marketing efforts. So across wow. the board for all of our products. What a journey. And you were so early full. I'm almost jealous. I mean, whenever I hear somebody when it got in that early, I suppose um, there is this initial feeling like you've missed out. But I don't think anyone in the history of Bitcoin has ever felt like they were early per se. There were always people before them. And I'd, I'd be interested to find out, for did your economics background in any way hinder you from actually really seeing Bitcoin from what it for what it was like early on? The whole Keynesian economics sort of a school of thought to that just was that a roadblock initially? You, you touched on it exactly. So my degree in undergrad was pure Keynesian economics, but I I wasn't uh, a great student at the university. I just didn't it didn't really make sense to me. And I knew that economics was an important degree and it felt like I should get that degree, but really I was more interested in, I minored in psychology. So I was doing a lot of psychology reading and learning, which I found a little bit more fascinating. And that's uh, where I, I kind of discovered Austrian economics alongside Bitcoin. And, and that's why I like Austrian economics a little bit more. It's more about humans acting and like individual action as opposed to Keynesian economics, which kind of, lumps everybody together and tries to model behavior on a, a macro scale. And ultimately, it doesn't really describe reality very well, in my opinion. So the Austrian School of Economics, which is what I discovered after learning about Bitcoin and, um, you know, fell down the rabbit hole, that really helped me, I think, describe Bitcoin and understand Bitcoin a lot better. But then it also helped shape my understanding of just how people cooperate and collaborate to, you know, prosper in a society. Absolutely. And yeah, I fortunately wasn't indoctrinated in any form of economics. I was um, went down the legal path. And so I sort of managed to stay clear of that. But when I think about the sort of seminal texts in Austrian economics, I put this out there recently and it got a little bit of um, blowback, but I found it incredibly hard to read that stuff. Like, you know, the it's, it's very dry. And I just wonder like how one actually can get more normies involved in Bitcoin if you're going to say to them, hey, by the way, here's this book you need to go and read, you know, um, with Mises and, you know, all, all these sort of heavy hitters. I mean, is there any, have you come across any texts that you think kind of can very succinctly or easily explain things from an Austrian economics point of view without having to say to them, hey, you know, go and sort of do the work. Here's a 2000 page book. Yeah, I think. You know, for me, reading Human Action, I, I did read it. It's probably my largest reading accomplishment, but it took me probably eight or nine months to make my way through it because it is so dense. And I find it to be a really, really valuable and good text to read, but probably wouldn't start there. I think there's a there was a recent book that came out uh, a year or two ago by Per Byland, which is about 100 pages, and it's called, I believe, How to Think About the Economy. And it's just a really high level introduction to thinking uh, critically in the Austrian manner. Another book that I think is a little bit more approachable and accessible is Economics in One Lesson, but it was written in something like the 50s or 40s. And so some of the examples that it provides are a bit out of date. But what I like about Economics in One Lesson is that 
it just teaches you to think about second order effects. So beyond maybe the the claim that you're reading and think about how people might behave uh, with with uh, with the claim being made. And I think you know it starts off with like the broken window fallacy where you know there's a group of people, a lot of Keynesians will will say, well, a broken window is good because then it employs the window, you know, the glass makers to be able to mm. build more windows. But the problem is, is that that takes away resources from other vendors or producers in an economy. If you're smashing windows and just replacing windows, you're spending all of your capital and time building windows and you don't have as much, you know, money or ability to uh construct other things and, and deliver other products and, and goods yeah as you describe that it almost makes you think of a situation where there are like in certain parts of the world it's considered appropriate to litter because there's somebody's job is to pick up litter and so it's like you know they're these kind of um things that are like, like well don't worry just keep breaking windows um and uh, you know that's my exactly first, right yeah my first experience of interesting economics that I'd say kind of breaks the mold from the traditional sort of Keynesian stuff was and maybe he is a Keynesian but Thomas Sowell and I found it really interesting because he he anal he analyzed the stuff from kind of different lens and would talk about the second and third order consequences and what I was also really sort of interested to see was how statistics are so incredibly manipulated to provide whatever sort of outcome that you want and you know they portrayed in a certain way, and so I'm not saying necessarily that everything Thomas Sowell says is correct, but it it certainly gets you thinking that it's like okay, well, all this other stuff that they say about the economy and how things necessarily work might not be true, and that kind of gets you going down the rabbit hole. Um, let's shift gears a little bit there, Phil, and talk a little bit more specifically about Unchained. And I'll say this kind of as a disclaimer, and this is obviously not a paid promo, but. Um, I'm a customer. I've been a big fan of uh, Unchained for quite some time. Um, obviously, didn't use you guys from the outset. I sort of initially, before I even bought Bitcoin, I thought, okay, I need to learn how to do self-custody. I did. And then within a few weeks, I had um, set up with a competitor, uh, Casa. And uh, it was only after they started dabbling in ETH that I decided that I'd rather shift to somebody who's focused more on Bitcoin only. I'd love for you just to talk at a very high level what your offering is about because you know if you hop online and see what you guys are up to there's a bunch of key services that you're offering and we'd love to just yeah get a better understanding of your business and kind of the the revenue model from your side well first of all thanks for being a client dale really appreciate it and glad to hear that you're enjoying the product unchained is a financial services company built for the long-term Bitcoin holder. So what does that mean? It's built on top of collaborative custody, multi-sig, where keys are distributed. Multi-sig is a form of custody where Bitcoin lives in an address. And instead of a Bitcoin address being controlled by one key, so if you have a ledger or treasure or cold card, something like that, and it's the only device that's controlling your Bitcoin, that's a single key address. Multi-sig is addresses that are constructed from three keys, for example, and two keys are needed to move the Bitcoin. So with Unchained, Unchained holds one of the keys and our clients hold two of the keys. So they have full permissionless access over the money, but Unchained is there in the event that they make a mistake, uh, that they you know pass away and their heirs need to recover the Bitcoin. And then we're able to offer a bunch of different financial services on top of that uh, custody model. So it's a very... Bitcoin native custody model to start with. And then it's all the financial services that uh, a long-term Bitcoin holder might need. Now, today we're, we're, for our financial services, we're primarily focused on the US, although we do hope to expand internationally uh, in the future. But our custody, our vault product is avail available worldwide because that is just kind of Bitcoin native. It's, it's Bitcoin multi-sig, which exists whether or not Unchained is there um, to be able to help you. And it's the same thing with Casa. So Casa is built on top of multi-sig. And uh, I believe with them, you can also go through a recovery process if Casa was, was to cease to exist. The major difference then is that 
Unchained is a is a financial services provider, so you are able to buy and sell Bitcoin directly from us. You are able to use your Bitcoin as collateral for a loan. Uh, we have U.S. Uh, retirement products like an IRA, and then we can help you, you know, for your inheritance if you have a, a trust or a, a, a business or a personal account. Okay, so there's a couple of things there. So in terms of your your current revenue model, as I understand, and perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like if you are sufficiently competent, you can go and set up your own unchained vault, um, your own multi-seek vault, and there's no fee attached to that. The only time there would be a fee attached is if there is a recovery, if you guys need to sign a key, or you offer some sort of uh, white glove kind of onboarding experience where I'm imagining that's for folks who just don't have any uh, confidence or perhaps just want that reassurance that they're doing the right thing because it's not the kind of thing you want to mess up. Is that is that my understanding is my understanding correct in that regard for your first point we are actually changing the way that we are charging for vaults so now uh clients do pay to get access to the unchained key and the unchained key is enterprise grade uh it's helps helps secure over six billion dollars worth of bitcoin and we have a team of people that is dedicated to protecting and managing and signing transactions so as part of your account fee, which is $250 per year, you gain access to the unchained key, which you can use in all of your products. So your personal account, your IRA. Okay. Um, yeah. So that is, that is a kind of a new change for 2024. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, sorry. Carry yeah. On. And then, no, no, no worries. And then to your second point, um, the concierge service is really designed for anyone. Um, but it's it's basically just white glove service. We'll ship you keys if you don't have them. We'll help you set up hardware wallets. We'll help you build a vault. And then we're there for you for the long term. So if you do ever make a mistake, you can always hop on a call with the Unchained team um, and you know recover your Bitcoin or or rotate out your keys if one is compromised. Yeah. And I notice. I mean, there's obviously quite a few different players in the market that are springing up. Um, some of them are charging a percentage based fee. That's not something that you you folks have explored or kind of what's the what's the thinking on your side? If if, if one is only I mean, whether I've got 100 Bitcoin or one Bitcoin, the fees 250, correct? That's correct for a yeah. personal account. Yes. OK. So okay. the way the way that we think about the BIPs fee is, and it's based on the asset under management, is that we found that Bitcoiners in general don't resonate with that model. Like it's kind of in a lot of ways, a somewhat of a fiat model to charge based on AUM. Um, and a lot of times when uh, you're charging based on AUM, like the people who have your money are actually rehypothecating it or lending it out. So with collaborative custody, which again is what Unchained is built on top of, it's not possible for us to lend out um, client funds for any sort of yield or anything. And so we, yeah, we, we just didn't think that charging based on BIPs was a long-term sustainable model. Uh, we think like a flat annual fee, and then we also make revenue from all of our other products and services. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And I suppose the, the key word that you use there are Bitcoiners. Um, Bitcoiners are the ones who are probably going to be the most resistant to a, a fee base, uh, a bit base fee, as you put it. Um, well, you know, in the you know legacy system, your your assets or your 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 net worth might increase by like five to ten percent, you know, a year. And with Bitcoin, that can happen in a day or. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, anytime we hear like a fee that's going to potentially go up uh, exponentially, it it is a uh, something that prevents a lot of folks from from pursuing that. So yeah, we we've just found that the annual fee model works best for us. Yeah, understood. Yeah. And um, you, you mentioned the sort of rehypothecation piece, and uh, I guess we'll we'll come around to the loan side of things. But one of the things we saw in the last cycle was how some companies were saying, hey, give us your Bitcoin and offer us, uh, you know, and we'll give you X percent. I mean, is that pretty much the only way that these companies could probably generate your 6% uh, was if they were going out and getting 10% elsewhere? I mean, that to me, I, I, you know, I'm not a finance major, but that seems to be the only way you can do it. Otherwise, how do you offer a yield in Bitcoin? That's right. And I think there were a lot of people, you know, during the last cycle asking, hey, where does the yield come from? 
And it's my perspective that when you're out there getting yield from these products, in reality, you are the yield. So your money that you're depositing is the yield for that company, right? So the company is, was all the companies that went bust, they were taking client deposits, they were lending them out to, you know, Terra Luna or Three Arrows Capital or whatever SBF's uh, fund was called. Alameda. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Three Arrows Capital was saying, we can get you 25%. They would pay the company 25% and the company would pay the client 5%. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the client's Bitcoin was just being taken and gambled on these extremely speculative, extremely insecure protocols, platforms, startups. And I think these companies just didn't respect the underlying asset, which was Bitcoin. Bitcoin is absolutely scarce money, fixed supply of 21 million, and it is totally immutable. So if you send Bitcoin to somebody, that transaction is irreversible. And this is what happened. These larger companies were sending Bitcoin transactions to these you know, speculative shops that were gambling the funds away. The funds were lost and there's no insurance or any sort of bailout that can happen, you have just lost your Bitcoin. Yeah. So when I think about Bitcoin, I think about it as a very long-term savings asset. I think personally, I use it as my long, long-term savings. And uh, the most important thing is to secure it well. And that's why I personally choose collaborative custody and multi-sig because there's no critical single point of failure. It's not like I can lose a hard drive in a dump with all my Bitcoin on it or forget the pin to a device and lose all my Bitcoin. That's what multi-sig solves. You can make a critical mistake without losing your funds. And it really respects and uses the native properties of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is just very different from any other form of money we've ever seen. Yeah. I think it's something maybe some trad fight folks have difficulty with is trying to get their head around the fact that it's sort of like a yieldless asset because they're always wanting a yield. And, you know, what we say sometimes in the Bitcoin world, and this will never resonate in TradFi, is like the, the yield in Bitcoin are the people you meet along the way because there's so many great people. But, um, yeah, to your point earlier, you know, all the companies that sort of uh, offered these products, um, they're very attractive at first. Um, I'll admit when I first got involved, um, you know, it's it was, it was just too tempting to uh, not to get involved. And so I did end up getting burnt. Um, I'm not sure how you folks in the States would put it, but um, uh, I paid Sorry my hear that. Yeah, not in a bad way. And at the end of the day, I, I, I actually, I mean, I did lose a little bit of Bitcoin, but I wasn't margin called and I didn't, um, you know, I wasn't involved in the BlockFi um, collapse. Fortunately, I had withdrawn everything by then, but um, the trade went against me because <laughs> I decided that I would leverage up against my Bitcoin, which proves to be such a silly thing to do. You should never try and leverage up against Bitcoin, especially with something so volatile at these early stages. Um, and this kind of leads neatly into the next segment, although you perhaps can't quite tell, is people in Bitcoin are now, in some instances, becoming very asset rich, but they're not necessarily cash flow rich. I mean, and there's, you know, cash flow is reality um, and, and balance sheet is sort of uh, vanity, I think something like that. So, you know, you, you kind of want, you, you still got to pay the day-to-day -day bills. You want to live, but you do not want to, you know, A, sell your Bitcoin or B, have a taxable event. So the loan piece is something that's really interesting. And I'd love to explore that because it's something that you guys were offering for quite some period of time. And then I believe you stopped taking on new clients I'd love for you to just talk to that 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 piece there for um, that you guys do have at Unchained the sort of the loan side of things and and how that product works and how that's evolved and what we could kind of look forward to in the future. Unchained's first product back in 2017 was our Bitcoin collateralized loan. So the way that it worked is you would move your Bitcoin into this two out of three multi sig address. Whereas a client, you could hold one key, so one hardware wallet, Unchained secures a key, 
And then we worked with a key agent to control that third key. So what that means is that the Bitcoin was never at risk of a single uh, party losing the funds, but at the same time, it was encumbered, right? So as a client, you couldn't move the Bitcoin without collaborating with Unchained. Unchained couldn't move the Bitcoin without collaborating with the client or with the key agent, and the key agent had to do the same as well. So this model is extremely secure. It's really, it's the most secure way to offer Bitcoin-backed loans. And that's how we were founded. And we've been offering that product since, yeah, 2017. Now, this year, due to external factors, we did pause our personal loans program. But we do offer loans for businesses and uh, potentially for other entities, uh, depending on the circumstance. We also have institutional loans, which is for you know the larger businesses uh, or enterprise. And okay. yeah, the way that... It- the way that it works is, again, you move the Bitcoin into the address. Um, it's over collateralized. We're able to lend dollars, which hit your bank account very quickly. Um, depending on the size of the loan, it could be within a day or two. And then you just, yeah, make those interest payments. And um, if the price of Bitcoin increases, then you can actually withdraw some Bitcoin out of that loan. And if the price of Bitcoin decreases, then you can add more Bitcoin as collateral or choose to, you know, rebalance uh, the collateral by, you know, selling some of the Bitcoin. But yeah, we we did pause the, the consumer loans program yeah. this year, although we are working hard to create another uh, liquidity product for individuals uh, to use Bitcoin and get uh, get liquidity. Okay, interesting. All right, and um, yeah, because I guess I guess the the smaller consumer loans have a lot of overhead associated with them, just in terms of getting that all sorted. And I'm, I'm sort of assuming that it can kind of get pretty complicated if you're talking about multi jurisdictional loans. You know, folks in Australia wanting to get dollars dropped into their account and all that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the interest interest payments. Sorry, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to pick your brain this one because I know people listening are, are really keen on this this particular one, myself included, um, is like, okay, so we deposit the Bitcoin with you. What are then the, lo- what's the loan term, typical loan term? Um, let's assume you've got this consumer product in, uh, in place, right? And what's the loan term and what are sort of the, um, like the interest payment uh, frequency, uh, you know, schedules, if you like? Sure. So... For any loan, there's an origination fee. And depending mm-hmm. on the duration of the loan, if it's six months or a year, it's anywhere from, uh, well, I don't know actually the exact fee now. I believe it's about 1% origination fee. Mm-hmm. And then um, there's 12 30-day installments of interest payments. And um, yeah, you make your payment. And then at the end of the loan, uh, you do have the option typically to uh, roll that loan over into a new one, like refinance it and uh, start that process again. As I mentioned before, too, you can close out a loan early and uh, there is no prepayment penalty for it. Okay, interesting. Because I think one of the things that, I mean, if I look forward into the future, and this might be a product that exists sort of four or five years out, um, and it would require uh, huge sums of capital. And that's what makes me think that the banks eventually, once they wake up to the opportunity, are going to be best positioned to do it because they can just create money out of thin air uh, whereas you guys actually have to you actually have to raise the capital yourself but the idea would be more or less over any four-year period whether you bought the top uh you know uh, four years ago or wherever it might be the the minimum return we've seen in bitcoin is generally about 100 percent. so you pretty much double your money every four years so the thought for me in an optimal world would be is that i can borrow the equivalent of four years worth of um, my lifestyle costs, whatever those might be. And and then at the end, and, and I'm not required to pay interest in the intervening period because the person who's providing me the loan is so confident in the strength of the um, underlying asset or the collateral that I've provided that they can go, look, we're doing this for four years. At the end of four years, entire capital sum plus all the interest repayments are due oh, by the way, it's doubled, so I'll just refinance. And so in that sense, I'm not actually having to um, dig into my pocket to be able to to make those payments. So I think in an ideal world, that's where I'd see it going. Is that something that you've ever contemplated? Um, Because I think we're really in a, it's it's, it's a pretty immature market and I'm not aware of any 
um, I guess, not many entities that are actively doing this in the in the space, at least ones that I would say have a reputation like Unchained. Yeah, and I think you, so there was a couple of things that I forgot to mention about the loan. So the way that the monthly uh, payments work is they are interest only, right? So you don't have to pay down oh, the yes. principal. Um, <laughs> and then the other point was your the interest rates. And, and right now uh, for an Unchained loan, the interest rates are anywhere from 14 to 16 percent during the uh, depending on the duration now as for your other kind of product idea I think it sounds nice but the problem is that you know as you're as you're explaining to these capital providers about um like the asset that they're lending dollars against you you inherently have to teach them about Bitcoin right <laughs> like you're hey you're gonna be lending dollars uh to long-term Bitcoin holders and you'll be earning you know 12 percent but at the same time they have to be asking themselves well I can you know earn 12 percent by lending to a Bitcoin holder or maybe I could earn more than that by purchasing Bitcoin so there's always that kind of dual uh dual nature of it where for capital providers, yeah, it's it's kind of like they need to learn about Bitcoin in order to feel comfortable to lend to Bitcoin holders. But then by learning about Bitcoin, it makes the case for them to purchase Bitcoin more instead okay. of loan. Totally. Exactly. And that's that's also like the great irony. I think it it's it exists within a couple areas of Bitcoin where it's like the incumbents are best positioned to be able to capture the opportunity, but because of their uh, I guess, worldview the way that they think about things and just the way these entities operate, the prospects of them actually being able to embrace that product are very low. And then to your point, if, if they see the value in a Bitcoin, then it'd be like, well, why don't you just put it on your own balance sheet? And why would you involve, you know, why would you try and earn 12%? Why would you just um, buy Bitcoin and enjoy 100%, you know, every four years? So what happens if you guys just became degenerates and, and um, the company went to hell? And um, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, obviously, I don't expect it to happen, but just playing devil's advocate here, like yeah, how, how would one actually access your Bitcoin in those um, circumstances? So let's say you've got two, you, you've got your two keys, they're geographically distributed, you know, you've got and different continents because you've been very cunning. You've, um, you know, even in steel plates, what, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that could go wrong? How could one ensure that you still have access to your Bitcoin in the event that Unchained goes belly up? Sure. So when you're securing your Bitcoin in an unchained vault, you it's a two of three multi-sig vault. So three total keys, mm -hmm. you have two of them. But when when we say that you have two keys, you actually have four items, right? You have your two metal seed phrases, and then you have your two hardware wallets. And you can lose any three out of four of out of those four, and you can still recover with Unchained's help. Right. So in your case, uh, you've geographically separated your steel plates, your seed phrases in two different continents. Maybe you have a device at home in your safe, and then you have another device a little bit closer by in, in you know, a bank vault or your office safe or something like that. In that situation, if Unchained were to disappear, so we, we've taken great, uh, we've made great strides into eliminating ourselves as a critical point of failure for our clients bitcoin and you know it's easy to talk about this stuff and be like oh yeah you can recover it you know but but then if it's like a super technical process uh it's as you know it's essentially like not having a recovery process yeah with unchained our recovery workflow is actually so easy that i when i'm demoing it i have to demo it like two or three times because all you do is you go to a website caravanmultisig.com and you load a file that you have. So when you set up your vault with us, we have you download a file, which is your multisig file. Mm -hmm. You take that file and you put it in a password manager, or some secure uh, encrypted online uh, storage. That can be online because it doesn't contain private keys. It doesn't contain your keys. You can kind of think of it as your treasure map to your vault. So anyways, you have this little file, mm -hmm. just like any other digital file. You mm -hmm. take that file and you load it into a tool. And that's it. Then you use your keys to sign your transaction like you would sign any other transaction. And another thing about vaults is that they're just 
super flexible. So if you do have another tool that you like to use better than Unchained, so there's other tools like Electrum or Sparrow, you can actually just load your vault into those tools and use it from there. You don't even need to log into Unchained's platform to access your vault and deposit Bitcoin and withdraw and so on. You mm -hmm. can use another open source tool in order to just do your day-to-day -day transactions with your vault. That just kind of shows the flexibility of the product. We really, really wanted to make it crystal clear that Unchained does not have to be around and you can use your Bitcoin like you would normally use. Now, if we did disappear, that would uh, that would indicate to you that one of the keys protecting your Bitcoin is compromised. And so you would want to move your Bitcoin into a new wallet where none of the keys are compromised. So it could be with another collaborative custody partner or a multi-sig wallet where you have all the keys or even just a single sig wallet. So you would definitely want to move your Bitcoin, but you could just use... Um, the open source tool that Unchained made, Caravan, you could use Sparrow, you could use other popular open source tools, and you would just be on your way. You wouldn't even necessarily notice a disruption. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. One thing I also appreciate about the product is the fact that um, and this feels like a an Unchained um, love story podcast, but I, I really do enjoy the product is, is they say, hey, by the way, you need to do a, a health check on your keys. And I'm like, oh, shit, okay, I better go and quickly uh, arrange that. And so it, it's it's really good to to stay on top of these things because, you know, in, in some ways you can say, yeah, sit and forget. But at the same time, I think it's very important to for you to stay on top of your stack so you actually know because it is the kind of thing where if you bugger this thing up. Um, Absolutely. And and I, I would actually say that Bitcoin, especially if you're controlling the keys, Actually, just in general, it's never going to be set and forget. So when you have the keys, you're using these hardware wallets, right? These are, you know, 60 to $150 devices that you might buy. Over time, vulnerabilities and enhancements are made to the devices and you need to keep them up to date. But those updates don't always go smoothly, right? So as you're updating the device, there's times where the update might not work. That's why you always have to have your seed phrases physically secured. And your seed phrases are a 12 or 24 set of words that represent the key that lives on the hardware wallet. So mm -hmm. I think of the seed phrase as the key. The hardware wallet is the tool that you use uh, to access the key. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, you got to keep that tool up to date because things change new enhancements are released, vulnerabilities are patched, um, but you don't want to be stuck only with a device, and especially with a device that hasn't been updated in years, because a lot, I think every, actually, let's see, yes, every single hardware wallet that I've ever used has had backwards incompatible updates. So at mm -hmm. some point, they get to a level where you need to upgrade, upgrade, and if you don't upgrade, the software moving forward isn't going to be able to work with that device. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and and what's so interesting about it, I mean, and you also raised kind of an interesting point is the fact that it we're, we're still pretty early. It, you know, I mean, we could still say we're very early in the sense of even when it comes to the, the hardware devices and I'm seeing more and more products being built where there's great UI and UX and I know it's only going to get better because as we want to onboard, let's imagine the 99%, uh, we're in the one percent. Let's imagine, and um, these tools need to just become. I, and I keep using the word idiot proof because I'm a bit of an idiot when it comes to tech. And it's just got to make sense. It's got to be intuitive and simple, and it's got to be like opening up Facebook or something like that. It's got to just be. You know, you don't have to think too hard. Um, and that's where things like the cold card can be a bit intimidating. I know initially when I first bought mine in 21, I, you know, I, I had a heart attack because I thought I'd lost my Bitcoin because I didn't quite know how the whole air gapping thing works and all that sort of thing. But you're, to your point, you've got to keep updating. And then on top of that, the new stuff keeps coming up. And so you've got to keep revising your setup. So it's not as if you go, if, let's say you've got a ledger and a Trezor and then you, you know that's it and you just need to upgrade the firmware forever because you might want to actually eventually go, hey, I actually want to move from this to a more open source one or actually, you know, it, it, you keep upgrading it. So I've recently started dabbling with Seed Signer. Um, mm -hmm. And no doubt in two years time, Seat sign is going to be old news and there's going to be something else that's, you know, even better. And 
you've got to keep sort of on top of your stack. So it helps to have somebody who's kind of really involved in the space and actively managing that. Um, and this sort of brings us to the point of um, kind of, you know, legacy planning. I'm not sure if this is something that's limited to, you know, clients in the States, but it's something that we talk about a lot here in Australia, where it's like, all right, what happens if you got hit by a bus or, you know, in the instance of like, you know, I often think to myself, like I've done this draw with my wife, I don't know how many times, but she glazes over. It's like, listen, if I die, like, do you know how to get this Bitcoin? You know, it involves a lot of sacrifice. And, um, you know, every time I think about spending money, I go, well, yeah, the opportunity costs is Bitcoin. So I just stack. So I'd hate for that to be in vain uh, and donate my Bitcoin to the network. So just tell us a little bit about that um, kind of legacy or inheritance planning and how you'd work with, uh, and I'm not sure of the terminology in the States, but like an executor um, who would be appointed to manage um, someone's estate if they passed away. I'm glad you brought that up because I think inheritance is really one of the under underserved needs uh, of Bitcoiners today. And it's something that at Unchained, we've thought about really deeply. So one of the benefits of being a financial services company in the US is that we can properly legally title your accounts that you have with us. So if you set up a personal account with us, in our eyes, the Bitcoin that lives in that personal account is legally titled to you. If you set up a trust account with Unchained, all the Bitcoin that lives in that trust is legally titled to the trust. So it makes something like inheritance from a legal perspective, which, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, inheritance is very, very much a legal process. Um, it makes it much easier. Now, there's really two aspects to Bitcoin inheritance. There's the legal title, which I kind of just covered, mm -hmm. and then there's the possession of the keys. Now, possession of the keys, to your point, needs to be something that, you know, the spouse of the Bitcoiner or the brother of the Bitcoiner or the son of the Bitcoiner can figure out. So that person is not necessarily as excited about Bitcoin as you might be, right? Yeah. What we designed at Unchained is an inheritance protocol that is very simple and non-technical. It is a set of legal looking documents um, with a couple letters and a tamper evident bag that you can just kind of like fill out your name, fill out the information on the letters, seal it up, give it to your executor or your heir. And then when the time comes, all they have to do is open up that tamper evident bag, follow the instructions, get in contact with Unchained, they have enough of the information to be able to recover with the help of Unchained. And because you have your Unchained account legally titled to you, we're able to just follow with your estate plan. Now, estate works a little bit, you know, inheritance looks works a little bit differently in every different country, but I think mm -hmm. in the British Commonwealth countries, so US, Australia, Canada, et cetera, it's relatively uh, similar um, in that, you know, you, you might form a trust, for example, and then all the Bitcoin in that trust is going to just go to the trustee. It's going to avoid becoming part of the legal record by, by going through the probate court process, and it just goes directly to the trustee. Now, if you have, you know, Bitcoin in a personal account, um, of course, we would, you know, it, it kind of goes through the will and the probate process. And we would work with whoever the court kind of tells us to work with. But the downside to that is then um, that's going to become part of the public record. So for US-based Bitcoiners who are looking to prevent their Bitcoin from becoming part of the public record, it's definitely, I would say, worth it to investigate whether or not a trust is right for you. But of course, just work with an estate planner. Mm. It's such an interesting one because Bitcoin being this sort of digital bearer instrument in some ways, and, and Bitcoiners would think like, Oh, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to circumvent the whole legal process and, and, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, this put my, you know, my brother died or whatever, but, and, and, you know, his, his express wishes were for me to inherit the whole thing. So I'll just, I know where the keys are, I'll just go and take it, but it has to go through this whole process. And I've always imagined like some sort of old, um, crusty, uh, executor sitting in a, in a, in an office who's just has no clue what's going on. And like, you know, cause you might not have appointed someone and, um, like just in practical terms, I was just always I'd be fascinated, fascinated to know like how those um, 
how those things, those conversations actually work. I mean, you know, here's the executor. They're supposed to collect all the assets, you know, um, and then sort of uh, discharge all the liabilities and then distribute the proceeds to the beneficiaries. But, um, you know, it, do you go there as like the brother and go, right, here we go. You need to open up this. You need to download a Sparrow wallet. And the guy's going like, what do you mean? Yeah, plug in the USB. Yep, yep, okay. It's it's It must be like a really fascinating thing, but it's inevitable um and it's gonna it, we, we need to think about that as bitcoiners so um for any listeners that a don't have a will um get a will because um there's nothing worse than i think having the state dictate how your assets get distributed uh and then b yeah really take some time to make sure that you're you've got some sort of redundancy so that you're not the single point of failure otherwise your um your energy stacking bitcoin will be in vain and um, well, yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. Like, and actually, yeah. just just one more thing there. Like, I think you know, a lot of Bitcoiners, we we want to have the most kind of mountain man technical setup, and that's great while you're alive, right? Like, no KYC coins, like geographically distributed multi sig with your keys all over the place, and so on and so on. But the problem is that the state can get involved after you're gone in ways that you don't expect right so if you know even if your heirs take possession of the bitcoin if you have like multiple heirs and you have no plan and there's some squabble like the heirs can start suing each other and it can become the states kind of in the state's purview to like make those types of decisions yeah. so like like you you can be kyc free but then cause your descendants to have like a ton of problems by not thinking through the legal side of it, even though, you know, you might not want to uh, let the state know about, you know, specific aspects of your life. So yeah, it's, it's like, it's definitely like a catch 22. And, and I think uh, that that might be one of my more controversial opinions is that when it comes to like this whole KYC versus no KYC discussion mm. about Bitcoin, like, inheritance is the thing that's going to absolutely crush a lot of people who haven't set up an estate plan uh, correctly. After I went through the process of learning about how inheritance works in the US, yeah. it just became obvious to me that whether or not uh, I, I believe that the government should know about these things is kind of irrelevant if my heirs can just get into a whole worlds of trouble by me not doing this. It just makes it a little bit easier. Of a I, yeah, I tend to agree. And um, the, the the state's tentacles will get involved in your affairs in ways that you never contemplated or in your, your heirs' affairs. And it's easy for us to think even perhaps at these levels today, you know, circa $70,000 that maybe, and you don't have the biggest stack on earth that, oh, my heirs aren't necessarily going, going to get into a squabble. But you can imagine 20, 30 years out, uh, if we think Bitcoin does what we imagine it to do, um, it's quite conceivable that you could be sitting on tens of billions of dollars. And it's it's funny, but I've got this this sense that like money just changes things so dramatically. Um, you know, between family members, between friends, it's it's perhaps one of the reasons why I think that you should, in general, keep your money affairs and you know oh, yeah, to yourself in the sense that you know obviously don't go bragging about your stack don't go talking about um your your assets and all that jazz um because it it does for me at least i mean if somebody said to me like i've got 150 bitcoin um uh, somehow like it's impossible for me to just see them as a person once I've realized that they're sitting on that kind of wealth. I haven't met someone like that, but do you know what I mean? And it just, and that's today. So you can imagine in the future, 20, 30 years from now, someone's, you know, this person's a whole coiner. Are you joking? And suddenly now the ears are starting to fight about these things. So yeah, it, there is this sort of tension that exists between the sort of anti-state libertarian sort of sentiment, which I think a lot of us are very um, sympathetic towards and perhaps rightly so. That's why we came here for the first place. But at the end of the day, I think that, uh, you know, firstly, the majority of us have completely doxxed ourselves and we have purchased KYC Bitcoin and we'd be really naive to think that we can just go, whoops, lost it in a boating accident. Like, it just doesn't work that way. Um, the state's going to want to get their little piece and there is the 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 monopoly of violence is such that the, the costs of 
the costs of um, failing to comply far outweigh the kind of so-called benefits. Um, I know a lot of people, at least here in Australia, and this is probably the case all over the world, is that you might want to have the, a tiny little no KYC stack when you're, you're selling your fruit and vegetables at the local meetup or whatever your shtick is. You know? Everyone's got their little thing and they come up and they sell little bits and bobs. And I think that'll be kind of a de minimis amount. And, you know, that's nice for you to think of as sort of like, you know, last, last resort. But your, but your core stack, I think the vast majority of people, yeah, it, it, you know, just do things by the book because I think it'll bite you in the ass if you try to get too cute or things like that in the future. Um, yeah, and, and I think in this in this inheritance <laughs> scenario, you can literally protect your your wealth from the state by playing some of the state's games. And like exactly. it is, you know, it's it's like taking a uh, it's a tough pill to swallow, I think, for a lot of Bitcoiners, but it's something definitely to think about because. Yeah, it, I, I, you know, Bitcoin is so unbelievably scarce, right? There's 21 million Bitcoin and around the world, there's what, 44 million millionaires, mm -hmm. right? So not even the millionaires in the world can have one Bitcoin. So if you have one Bitcoin and you're sitting on that, that that is potentially like multi, multi-generational wealth that you need to figure out how to protect and uh yeah for me I, I just i'm thinking about you know my my legacy like i i stumbled on this really early um and i've heard so many stories of people squandering bitcoin losing it and i just don't want to be one of those one of those statistics right so my whole goal is to just try to like protect and preserve as much bitcoin as i can while i'm still alive so that i can pass it on to my uh kids and grandkids and great grandkids and so on Totally. And that, that's what drives me for. I mean, I've always, I've said this so many times on the show, people are going to be like, maybe they'll get snotty in the comments, but it's like, I'm not as obsessed about accumulating things. Like I don't need things. I like experiences and I want to do good things in the world. And I think wealth is optionality and it gives you the ability to do things like that. And I'm also thinking about, um, you know, generational wealth. I'm thinking about what my kids can actually do in the future. Um, and as you know, and this is the first time I probably I haven't spoken about it on the show, but I'm expecting to have a a child in September, first one. And Congrats. when I think about what her future looks like, thanks. <laughs> I think to myself, I want her when she's 21 to be like, my God, my dad was a legend. Look, look at what he did. You know what I mean? Like, I can't believe that he that he's a whole coiner potentially, that kind of thing. So yeah, when, that, have you seen that meme of the family sitting around? Yes. Like, Dad, what were you doing? A fucking legend, right? Yes, it's exactly. So true. Exactly. And, I, and that's what I that's what I think about. So, you know, not everyone's concerned about a legacy, but I, I think that this is an opportunity, and I and I've pitched this to sort of some high net worths with very limited success, but this is the equivalent of you know, the Carnegie's and the Rothschild's really sort of getting in at the beginning of industry, steel and, you know, shipping and all these sort of core industries, the industrial revolution. And yet <clears throat> this is now the digital revolution. And we're sort of the, I mean, it's a bit different in the sense that we're not entrepreneurs. All we have to do is store our savings in Bitcoin. But I think this is, the Bitcoiners of today are going to be the titans and the generational wealth families of hundred years time um and they'll be sort of you know dressed as if they're homeless wearing um you know uh, slippers and all that kind of thing because it's just kind of part of the big hey man this is a new shirt all right <laughs> <laughs> but it's so funny and you contrast to the crypto bros and it's like let's yeah. get my lambo and they'll probably be broke in like five years whereas you know the bitcoin is that i know like i don't know a flashy bitcoiner i honestly have never met someone who is just flash yes have all the the watches and the rings and the jewelry and the cars and there's just something there's this kind of depth and um this feeling of wanting to preserve something for long 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 into the future hence the reason why this 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 um loan product is so important to me personally in the future because that's the way that i plan to be able to to do this um one thing i didn't ask and i probably should have earlier on is these etfs because uh we're seeing you know, I don't have the figures offhand, but I mean, BlackRock now have over 200,000 plus um, Bitcoin under management. And I think that trend is pretty, it's kind of unstoppable in some sense. Um, I don't know what the conversations are like internally, but would you be able to just share a little bit about sort of how Unchained views the ETFs? Are they kind of a tailwind in the sense that they're giving 
they bring you additional eyeballs to the space and then people figure out, oh, self-custody is the game? Or do you think that they perhaps are detracting from the self-custody piece? I think the former, definitely. And that's what I've seen. It, and maybe we're lucky because we have such a differentiated product from the ETFs. But as I mentioned earlier, Unchained is kind of the, the final the final place your Bitcoin moved to. So the ETFs might be a really good way to gain exposure if you're brand new to Bitcoin because it's in that traditional structure like you're used to. It looks like a stock. But then as you start learning about Bitcoin and you understand the layers and layers and layers of counterparty risk that are heaped on top of all of those ETFs, then you start thinking, hey, maybe I should take Maybe I should own some Bitcoin. Like right now, all I own is an IOU of an IOU of an IOU of Bitcoin. And then you learn about keys and how to manage them. And that's when people find Unchained. So that's kind of been our, that's that's how we've onboarded, I would say, so many, you know, a significant portion of our clients is just that we're we're kind of that, that last place that you need to go to with your Bitcoin. Um, I but I, I do think that the ETFs are, are, a net benefit, and this might also be controversial because it does so much of the heavy lifting for Bitcoiners in terms of convincing somebody to look into Bitcoin. Like if you know nothing about finances or Bitcoin or money, like just the fact that it's listed in your Schwab account is, it goes a long way in terms of convincing somebody to try it out. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, net benefit. I mean, we can talk about the centralization risk of the likes of um, Coinbase who hold most of it and and that kind of thing, um, who can't even get lightning rights. See, the, the benefit of being a talk show host is like almost, uh, I can just talk smack about all sorts of companies, whereas you guys have to be more professional. But it, it does strike me as like, you know, it, it's strange that you've got Coinbase as being the custodian of all these ETFs, yet they are being sued by the SEC, the very entity that actually approved I, to list them. It's I, it's a great irony, but it is what it is. I think it's totally fine for me to say that I think that having a single company be the cust custodian for you know nine, what is it, nine out of ten ETFs or like that, yeah, whatever. Like that is a massive, massive risk. And actually, Tour de Maester had a really interesting quote recently where bitcoin is the least risky asset that you can own but the bitcoin etfs might be the most risky etfs to own and again it's because of this centralization risk mm -hmm. like almost all of them are just using coinbase as their custodian if coinbase runs into any problems that means that the bitcoin is gone and and guys like bitcoin is immutable if it's gone it's gone it's not coming back yeah. So okay. with Bitcoin, no single company should or needs to have the ability to lose any amount of your Bitcoin. What Coinbase could do is they could be one key in one of these multi-sig arrangements, a network of key agents, right? So Coinbase could hold a key, another company could hold a key, another company could hold a key. Three separate companies that are all helping to secure the Bitcoin but none of which are single points of failure. This is all possible and it's available now, right? Okay. Unchained's platform allows us allows you to do that. You can hire multiple companies to control keys on your behalf. But we're also just so early here that all these ETF, uh, all these ETFs just wanted to get to the market as fast as possible. And if you're trying to get to the market as fast as possible, you need a custodian that checks all the boxes. Now, the boxes don't necessarily apply to Bitcoin like they might apply to the dollar, but they are being applied to Bitcoin in the same way. And Coinbase checks all those boxes. I think there's a few more custodians that are uh, starting to join the fray. I know. So Fidelity has done the hard work of creating their own in-house custody platform, which is great. Um, and then I believe BitGo was also selected to uh, be a partial custodian for one of the ETFs, and I'm forgetting which one right now. It might be Bitwise, but yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, these 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 things exist already. I think OnRamp already does some sort of form of um, you know multi institutional collaborative custody type thing. Um, maybe or maybe not, but yeah, it's it 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 was more just about like, hey, everyone else is going to everyone else is like we we're competing. We want to list, and so I think. 
some of them actually were like, yeah, we want to be able to do in-kind redemptions. And the SEC says, said no. And then it was like, well, do you want to do you want to list and compete? Or do you want to try and just fight on principle, as Joe Colasari told me? And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. They just want to get it. They want to get their foot in the door. And then maybe over time, they're going to diversify their, um, you know, whoever custodies their, their assets. And they might also allow for in-kind redemptions. Um, last little point I want to touch on, and this is a, a, a kind of a fun hopium section of the of the show um and i was thinking about this last night and uh I, what i kind of wonder is um we've seen over each of these halvings um from sort of the the price of the halving through to the top i think the first one was kind of 90x then it was 30x for the second one then the third was i think eight and a half or something like that so you know you're kind of going well are we expecting like a 3x if we're just following kind of the 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 sort of pattern um or is this going to break all the previous models because um yeah i haven't quite got my head around that because it's kind of like have we front loaded a lot of demand and now the demand is going to be thinner subsequent to the halving or is this just kind of i'm not going to say super cycle because that kind of triggers me but uh, you know what i mean but yeah are we just going to sort of potentially just follow like clockwork um and even go beyond like what we've expected and that the sort of idea of diminishing returns might be over. Like where's your mind at in that respect? Um, whether it's you or the company, I don't know. Yeah, this is all just me and not not the company. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a perma bull. So, you know, I thought that the ETFs were gonna be approved in like 2016. I thought we were going well over hundred K uh in 2021. Um, so I've been wrong about the small things over the years, but right about the big things, which is that Bitcoin is the signal. Yes. Um, so with that disclaimer, uh, I I think that we are going to be significantly surprised on the upside this cycle because, you know, when I think about these ETFs, right, one out of 10 ETFs by itself would have been the most successful ETF launch of all time, right? And then there's 10 of them. So mm -hmm. I think like, th you know, all, almost all of them, if they had been launched standalone, would have been the most successful ETF launch ever. So the demand for Bitcoin from these traditional uh, Wall Street firms is immense. And it's it's like just getting started. I can't imagine any Wall Street company right now that isn't thinking about Bitcoin as a result of these ETFs. Like the daily flows of them are absolutely massive. And again, this is just the beginning. Like it takes a long time for these large, you know, pension funds to decide to allocate some percentage of their portfolio to Bitcoin and they're going to they're going to dabble and then they're going to see that it's the best performing aspect uh, best performing asset in their portfolio and then they're going to move more and then they're going to move more it's my perspective that bitcoin is the global reserve currency it will will become you used ubiquitously uh and people are just still haven't they haven't figured it out yet so yeah i think i don't know if it's going to be this cycle or next cycle but at some point hyper bitcoinization happens awesome yeah no i it's um i, I tend to yeah I, I fluctuated a lot in this particular one but because we i felt that the last cycle's returns were a little bit muted perhaps sort of um you know cut short by virtue of all the grifters and the sbfs of the world um i felt like it, i need to moderate my expectations for the cycle just so that i can keep my mental health in check because sometimes you can if you've got like really lofty like you're going like this is going to 500,000 like if it gets to 250 you're going to be pretty gutted you know but for me now I'm kind of like I'm very chilled and I say like look if we just double from here and that's the top from the cycle like I'm chilled with that like I'm not you know I, I say perhaps this this analogy will escape you because it's a cricket one but I'm not playing t20 which is like you know sort of 20 overs of cricket I'm playing five day cricket and it's just like day one so let's just relax but um high is better yeah, 
you know, for me, I'm not selling either way because what do you sell for, right? Like right Bitcoin exactly. and the reserve currency, and I'll I'll use my Bitcoin to improve my life in small ways. But yeah, again, I'm kind of thinking about it as how do I preserve as much of it as possible to pass on to the future generations. Oh yes, absolutely. Paul, this has been a real pleasure and um, really great to connect with uh, someone at Unchained. It's been, um, yeah, as I say, it's a, it's a conversation I've been wanting to have for a long time. Uh, big fan of your work uh, there at Unchained. And yeah, I can't stress how important it is for folks to really get their security in order. And I think you guys are one of the companies I'd probably recommend. And so, um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on the show. Do you want to maybe give a handoff to uh, to the listeners where they can find you or and the business? Sure, you can find me, Phil Geiger, at Phil underscore Geiger on Twitter. You can email me, phil at unchained.com, and you can find Unchained at unchained.com. So definitely give us a look and uh, reach out to me if you have any questions. Dale, thanks for having me. Super. Okay. And one correction, if it's called X, please. Hey, don't call it Twitter. Oh, X, right. <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> Elon, I'm so oh. sorry. I know he's one of your listeners. Elon is. Apologies. Exactly. I'm yeah. sorry, Elon. But by the way, I'm still waiting for my Tesla. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for coming Thanks, on. Thanks, Dale. Till then. Bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and that you got some value out of it. Either way, hit me up on Twitter and let me know what you think. My handle is Dale21M. If you've got any suggestions as to people you think I should be talking to or topics I should address to, I would love that sort of feedback. Otherwise, if you want to support the show, there's a couple different ways you can do that. The first is just to share it amongst your friends and family. The more that people hear the message that Bitcoin and crypto are not the same thing, the better. And I want to help people understand that. The second thing you can do is give me a five-star review on whichever podcast app you're using. Of course, that's only if I deserve it. And last but not least, if you want to stream Satsmoe via the Fountain app, I'm not going to say no, but it's not expected. Thank you so much for your support thus far. It means the world to me. I appreciate the hell out of you and the best is yet to come. Much love, friends. I'll see you on the other side.